Hey brother Hear me now Brother dog Know me Understand Welcome to the Sargasset Podcast. I'm Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francesca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. And we are going to share with you the latest ideas and concepts about sargassum and sargassum beaching events, which have become an international challenge. Welcome everybody to the Sargassum Podcast. Um, Hi, Mar, and hi, Robbie. How are you doing today? Hi, guys. Nice to see you. I'm doing pretty good. I'm I'm happy to see my uh, long lost friend again. And it seems like it's been ages, that, and it has been. So I'm pretty it happy has been. about Summer that. Summer holiday was in between. <laughs> I know. It's got to be nice. I wish I wish I knew what that felt yeah, like. How was- how was your holiday, Robbie? I heard you were visiting Fran. Well, I got to visit her for a little bit, but I wouldn't say that that was a holiday. That was, I was working. The only time I wasn't working is when I was with them. And all the rest of the time is work every, every day. We met with the university. We met with teachers. We you know, we had to get down and meet with some uh, 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 megafauna, marine megafauna biologists at Chetumal and, uh, at uh, the University of Quintana Roo. And we met with um, the... The Secretary of Education, Secretary of Education with the Departmental of Education, and we got some research agreements signed. We're working on a couple more, and uh, yeah, I was busy, busy, busy Very the whole cool. time. But nice, when nice. I was with Francesca, yeah, well, when I was with Francesca and Joseph, they had lots of rum, so I didn't, I didn't accomplish anything while I was there, and it was awesome. Yeah, but we did go to a meeting together, so I think you did accomplish something. <laughs> So when Robbie was here, beginning of July, right? Um, we already here in Playa, Playa del Carmen in Mexico had, I don't know how many weeks of brown water and I haven't been in the ocean for a very long time. So of course we wanted to do something fun with Robbie after showing him the beach and how brown the water was and how the sargassum was piling up. And Stinky. one of the people, yeah, one of the people living where I'm living told us in Puerto Morelos, the beach is clear and the water is clear and the beach is clean. So I was like, we got to go because I want to get in that water. So on the Saturday that Robbie was here, we went to Puerto Morelos and we got to enjoy the the beach and we got to enjoy snorkeling and being in the ocean um, Robbie saw, you saw barracuda hunting, right? I, I mean, I've seen them lots and lots of times, but this is the first time I ever saw one go. Yeah, that, that was that, so that was really that cool. Just all those fish just like scattered. And he, yeah. And then there was just a shower of scales coming down from his mouth. Yeah. And then on Sunday, we had a bit of a late start, but. We wanted to go to Cenote. So me and Robbie in the heat of Quintana Roo, as it, it's very hot, we went into Colectivo. We drove about a half an hour out of Playa to go to the place where there's three different Cenotes you can visit. We went to the first one we wanted to go to and they said, oh, we're full. We have reached capacity for today. So we went to the other two to see if we could go to any of those. And it was the same thing. So we had to go back home and ended up swimming in the tiny, tiny cenote next to the beach in um, Playa Esmeralda, where there's just a lot of locals with their kids, um, um, you know, bathing every day. I was just going to say that it's it's actually amazing how it has changed because I was there, I remember like six years ago, it was one of the first trips I did with my husband and we went diving in one of the cenotes and there was almost no one there and it was beautiful and it's amazing to see how quickly these things change, right? That people suddenly are going in masses to the, to the cenotes. So I'm very excited about the interview we're having today because as you just said, Fran, this is exactly the topic we're going to talk about today. Yes, I'm really excited as well because, yeah, it's what I've been living all summer and it would be, I'm really excited to hear about, um, 
yeah, the, the professional opinion or the scientific opinion behind this. I was going to say that one one thinks that uh, thanatos are not infected by sargassum, but actually they are, right? And we will hear today why there's a connection between between them and the sargassum. Yes, exactly. Well, I, I would posit the idea that possibly the, the, the reason that there were so many people there was a direct connection to the sargassum. They People couldn't go to the beach. Well, we'll and, hear uh, about that and later so I, on. I, I would so. say that, that, that they're certainly being affected there. Yeah. So let me introduce our guests before we blurt out all the things that they actually found um, in our pre-interview talk. Um, so today we're going to talk with um, Courtney Gallagher, which is a jointly appointed associate professor in the Department of Geogra Geographic and Atmospheric Science and also the Center for for the study of women, gender, and sexuality at the Northern Illinois University. Her fields of study include women in science, sustainable agriculture and food systems, and environmental management and sustainability. And our second guest um, is Emily Hernandez, which is a master's student at the Geographic and Atmospheric Science um, Department at Northern Illinois University. And she researches how tourism impacts water quality in Quintana Roo, in Mexico. She also does some work in the fields of environmental sustainability and is an advocate for advancing minorities in STEM. Welcome to the podcast, Courtney and Emily. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, well, the, 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 there's, um, I'm really pleased to be here today, just to be invited to this group because somehow I feel like an outlier for some reason. I don't know why. Or maybe they just needed me here for the diversity. And I'll, um, <laughs> anyway, we always start out with, uh, you know, wanting to know uh, really a very, one very specific thing. And we're not, not really looking for a sciencey answer here, but uh, maybe that's what you'll give us and that'll be fine too. But we'd like to know, and we're going to start with Emily. I'd like to know what sargassum means to you. Um, okay, so that's a very interesting question. What I think, when you ask me what sargasm means to me, what I think is you're asking me why it's important and why we're talking about it, which I would say it's, as if you read the paper, um, sargasm has been getting worse and worse as time progresses so there's been a couple of years where it was like extremely bad and then the year of 2019 it was one of the worst they've ever had um so i think it's important sargasm is important to talk about specifically in the caribbean because so many places in the caribbean depend on tourism and sargasm is detrimental to tourism as we have seen in many places um so to me, sargasm is something that we need to address and talk about specifically as climate change gets worse because it will continue to get worse. Um, yeah, I'm just picking up on where Emily was at. You know, sargassum is interesting to me because I, we have a colleague that's Japanese that does research um, in the Quintana Roo area with us and he he's constantly confounded by this idea of sargassum because in his culture, as in many cultures around the world, seaweed is a very beneficial thing, right? Like it's farmed for food, it's used for medicine and so forth. And yet here it has become this environmental problem, which has rippling social and economic implications too. And so it's this interesting example to me of how um, situational environmental problems can be and also how Sargassum, the sargassum problem in the Caribbean is sort of this indicator species or this indicator of these changing global environmental problems, probably somewhat related to climate change, global social and economic patterns that are shifting, likely related to changes in sort of industrial agriculture and urbanization in various parts of the Caribbean, um, you know, leading to nutrient runoff. And so it's... Um, you don't want to say it's a cool problem because it's causing all sorts of detrimental effects, but it's an interesting problem in that pulling it apart and teasing apart why it's there and the implications are complex. 
Very nice. I Thank totally you so much agree. for that. Um, so, <laughs> Robbie and I, in the pre-brief, um, pre-talk, already talked a bit about how we think that tourism reacts in Quintana Roo to sargassum. But you guys actually studied this and did some surveys and figured it out and, and really got better data than what we have. So can you tell us how do tourists in Quintana Roo react when there's sargassum on the beach? Um, I guess I can start uh, first, if that's okay, Courtney. Of course. Um, so obviously, um, I'm not sure if you, get, if you all read the article, but um, in the article, um, obviously, we were working down there, and we said that during the specific season of the 2019 year, um, people were canceling their reservations if if they weren't in the region yet, if they hadn't traveled to Mexico yet. They were canceling their reservations, um, posting, sharing photos on social media about the seaweed, the sargasm, like telling people, like, you know, don't go here, like, you're just going to, like, encounter, like, bad smells and like a beach full of seaweed right now those that were already in mexico and they were already um in the region and they found themselves with a beach full of seaweed sarcasm um they were deciding to spend less time at the beach so from the article if you read it again we found that 59 percent of local residents were spending less time at the beach and 47% of tourists were spending less time at the beach because of the seaweed problem. So then we saw, well, they're not spending time at the beach. Where are they going to go since they're already there? Like, what else are they doing? Um, so that's when we asked the question, where are you guys going instead of the beach? Why are you spending your time instead of the beach? And obviously, cenotes were the first very like it was like the number one option for both locals and tourists um i have some of the statistics here 50 56 percent of tourists were choosing to go to cenotes instead of the beach because of the seaweed problem interesting and and can i ask you for for our listeners that maybe don't know uh what what cenotes are can you explain to us what cenotes are and how they're formed and why are they so attractive for for tourists of course, uh, Courtney knows a little more about it. <laughs> sure. Um, so the entire Yucatan Peninsula is built on what's called karst geology. So it's carbonate limestone um, and carbonate is affected by carbonic acid, which forms when rainwater interacts with um, CO2 in the atmosphere. It forms carbonic acid. It can dissolve the limestone and it creates all these really cool features like cave systems, which are found throughout the entire Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and when you hit um, collapse of a cave system, it will open up the ceiling and create these open holes, which create um, these tourist cenotes. Um, and so the water that is found inside these cenotes that look like giant swimming pools is really the groundwater that people are swimming in. Um, so it is the same water system that people are pulling their drinking water out of that is being pumped in well fields and sent to you know the major cities in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, but because they do provide these freshwater resources, um, uh, they are used um, not just for domestic uses, but for tourism. And so cenotes um, are, are kind of unique to this region. Um, I, I, you do find them anywhere there's carbonate limestone, but there's a huge, huge collection of cenotes in this region, per, partially just because of the geology and partially because they're of, of this massive impact crater from... Um, Oh, shoot, maybe you guys can help me. The name of the meteor that hit the Yucatan and is, is sort of tied to the extinction of the dinosaurs all those millions of years ago. You, if you map out the cenotes in the Yucatan, you can see that it forms this ring. Um, and that's because it caused such friction and fractures in the, um, the karst rock, the, the geology there, that um, over time that is preferentially kind of where erosion happened and, and why we have all of these cool cenotes in the area. And so cenotes have now become a pretty massive part of the tourism industry. Wow, I, I didn't know that, but I, I remember from diving in the cenote, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you also have a layer of salt water below them, right? Coming yeah. from the ocean. So you have yeah. this uh, very strong pignocline in between the fresh water and the salty exactly. water. Exactly. So the closer you are to the coast, the more sort of salt water intrusion you get. 
so that you'll have a lens of salt water sitting underneath a lens of fresh water. And then as you move inward, that goes deeper and deeper. And so um, it, it, depending on where you're swimming, you can hit that sort of salt water um, incline. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the research project that Emily was referring to in the paper we conducted in 2019 with this fabulous group of undergraduate research students that we recruited from around the United States to go down and do research um, on the impact of tourism on water quality specifically. And so this sort of tourism cenote connection was a really obvious um, choice for us to study. And so uh, we did surveys and interviews and, and we're looking at um, policies as well as trying to understand the impact of tourism on cenote and water quality. Yeah, and it was very yeah. interesting how this project came to be because we were thinking about like, oh, what are we going to do? Because we had to come up with the research project and I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. But um, once we got there, we saw how bad this problem was. So we kind of like turned our heads towards the seaweed problem because once you're there, once you're by the beach, you just notice it so quickly, the smell, like you can see it in the water. Um, so it, it kind of just like came out of nowhere because we saw it and then we kind of just like started digging more and more into it. So what we're interested in is at, at this point is um, what are some of these, you know, they're, they're actually, I guess we'd say we're the, the stuff is being more heavily exported than they ever have been before. And uh, so as a result of sargassum and all this here, how, how has this uh, increased anthropogenic interaction with the cenotes? How is, uh, what, kind of, what kind of things are we learning from this? Um, so anytime people go into an environment, there are obviously anthropogenic impacts. But some of the concerns that we have about cenotes specifically have to do with the fact that when people are swimming in cenotes, they're literally swimming in people's groundwater, which then becomes their drinking water supply and so forth. And the sen we have colleagues who have done, who are water geochemists, who have done testing of water in the cenotes in the region and have been able to identify all sorts of anthropogenic um, identifiers, we'll say. So the presence of sunscreen compounds, antibiotics, illegal and legal drugs, um, fertilizer runoff, all of that has been identified in these cenotes at different quantities and different locations. Um, how do they get there? Well, things like antibiotics and drugs, it's often people urinating in cenotes while they're swimming. Sunscreen is runoff from people's body. Um, most cenotes do in fact request that the clients don't wear sunscreen or shower off before they get into it. Of course, if they're showering, that water is just going into the groundwater, right? Um, so it's all the same system. Um, but we also observed during our research period, tourists talking about how they just like put sunscreen on, on the bus so that then the tour operators would not notice that they were wearing sunscreen. Um, so the point being that the, these chemicals make their way into the cenotes and they change the ecology of the cenotes, right? So there's concerns about contamination from a human perspective if the people are consuming the groundwater for um, you know, drinking water or using it for bathing and so forth. But there's also just implications for the ecology. These were previously fairly pristine ecosystems. Um, and anytime you introduce a change in terms of nutrient composition or presence of chemicals, it has the potential to, to change these um, ecosystems really long term. And in the sunscreen in particular um, is an issue not just in ocean ecosystems where we're concerned about degradation of the coral reef systems, but the whole point of sunscreen is to block the light, right? So all of those particles, when they get into the water, block the light. And so um, if you're looking at an open cenote ecosystem where there's a certain amount of light that comes in and feeds, you know, the, the, um, the presence of algae or plant life or, you know, other aquatic um, uh, biota, and now you've got something that blocks the light in there, it just changes what can live and what can grow, and you will often get the presence of more harmful things. Um, let, let me follow up a little bit on that. Um, you know, it sounds like you're having problems with emergent contaminants to me and all, which is, I think we're running into just about everywhere these days. Um, and I know you're focused on the cenotes, but there are you know, certainly septic systems in the area. Are, are, have you been testing any, uh, any whales in the area to see what you're finding in, in whales close by? Or are you just, just looking at cenotes or, or what's going on? 
We have not, but our colleagues who are part of this broader research experience for undergraduate program that Emily started out as an undergraduate student with me on and is now a master's student. It's funded through the National Science Foundation. Um, we have some colleagues and their research assistants that have been testing well water, and they certainly have found some of these chemicals um, in, in the, the drinking water systems as well. Yeah, and there's a paper out that talks about that. Um, if you're interested, we can send you the link. Please do. Yeah. I have seen like a documentary that shows how not treating the, the domestic wastewater well and, and, you know, having chest pits here is also impacting the, the groundwater and, yeah, the same groundwater that the cenotes are Absolutely. connected to and seeing videos of what those underwater rivers look like below Playa del Carmen and Tulum, it yeah. is disgusting, full of plastic, brown. Yeah, it's it's really bad. Yep. Our, yeah, we have some colleagues this year that are um, starting to look at um, microplastics in the groundwater and then separately looking at the leachate from the sargassum landfills for back of, lack of a better word so you know along the beach they now have these systems for collecting the sargassum um, sometimes they have booms out in the ocean sometimes they just scoop it up off the beach but when they take it somewhere oftentimes that is not a formal landfill it's just a field that they have designated to be a landfill um, and so as that decomposes there's all this leachate coming off and a lot of it is biomatter but as I'm sure you know, sargassum is particularly good at chelating other types of toxic chemicals. Um, and so there's some concerns too about how that might impact groundwater systems. Yes, and I, I've heard that some places where they have those landfills that they have a liner below so that there can't be any or less leakage, but I'm sure some of them don't have that. Mm -hmm. So if any of our listeners are in charge of one of these dumping grounds of sargassum on land, make sure you, you put a liner below it because it really makes a difference for safeguarding your soils and your groundwater and all that stuff. It's really, really important. And hopefully, at least in Quintana Roo, there's more and more companies who are using sargassum to make products. So hopefully at one point in the future, we won't actually have a lot of it going into those landfill or dump sites and actually it will be used as a resource. So we already talked a bit about why it's important to protect the water quality of the cenotes. Um, do you think it's that it has a really big impact on the groundwater if more people go to the cenote or is it, is it probably a bit minor? Um, I can talk a little bit about this one so since this podcast is about sargasm <laughs> um i feel like there is indirect impacts from sargasm to some of this obviously they're not like directly linked but they're indirectly linked if that makes sense um sargasm is pushing people towards cenotes and now people more people are swimming in cenotes so now the question is so that we know it's happening so we know it's happening so now the question is um are there any environmental regulations or um, any policies that can mitigate those changes that are coming because they are already happening so how can it be mitigated you know um so let's see so in the paper we saw that there we we studied the three different states, I think, right? It was Yucatan, Quintana Roo, and Campeche. And um, we compared the regulations that are already in place. And we found that there is little to no regulations at all in these cenotes. Um, I think Yucatan was the one that had the most regulations, but they weren't as rigorous uh, as they should be. Um, but Courtney can talk more about that because I know she's um, she analyzed it more, a little more than me. <laughs> So I guess um, first, just to the question of whether uh, having tourists in Cenote's big picture impacts groundwater quality, I think that you need 
groundwater flow is not totally lateral, right? Like it's going to stay concentrated a little bit. So part of it is the question of whether people living in and around the cenotes when they're drawing drinking water and so forth are going to be impacted by tourism. Maybe is the data that our colleagues are finding. But I think bigger picture, there's also this issue of this is a really fragile groundwater dependent ecosystem. And if we're interested in environmental conservation, then we need to think about sort of these issues of regulation and tourist carrying capacities and so forth. And these regulations are lacking at this point in time. You know, um, the regulations do vary by state and municipality, but there are very few that do put tourist carrying capacities from an ecological standpoint. So I was interested in your story where you said that you went, um, I think I know which cenote you went to, and um, tried to enter and it was full. And I assume that actually has more to do with staffing issues and just sort of management of the cenote and less to do with ecological concerns would be my guess. Um, if, if it is ecological concerns, then it was the initiative of the owner. It probably wasn't ecological concerns, but because we have the COVID crisis still and we are in exactly. the orange phase. So there is um, certain like most tourist places have, I think, 30 or 50 percent capacity loads that they can have. So each place, whether it's a shop or a cenote, has an amount of people that can go there because of COVID. So maybe that is actually helping the cenotes and giving some regulations on there that aren't due to protecting well, the environment, but will still help to do so. And one of the things we're, we're waiting for our colleague to analyze this data, but when everything sort of shut down at the start of the pandemic, um, our colleague at CC started going out to the field once a month and collecting water from all the different cenotes that are on the cenotes and um, some, very, some, some of the well fields. And so we have data points every month since the start of um, the, the pandemic to kind of see what happened with uh, you know, groundwater contamination falling. And so we're, we're excited, we're waiting for all those results and I'm excited to see kind of how that, how that pans out. And so I want to ask a question related to that, because we've been talking about the indirect effects of sargassum. So the tourists going more yeah. to the cenotes and the, the people mm -hmm. contaminating the, the cenotes themselves. But also we have the direct impact of sargassum through this groundwater leakage of these brown waters, right? Mm -hmm. And of the uh, contamination from the landfills. And so which one is most important? Because, of course, if we start restricting um, people from going to the cenotes or like now with COVID, you know, I ha have a limited number. That's of course going to do us a favor, but is this the relevant part or should we be actually tackling the sargassum part? Because that's the one that is worse than the humans being there or are they equal? I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, to be <laughs> honest, but my best, my educated guess is that it depends on the geography of a cenote. So if you're very, very close, to one of these areas where you're getting significant groundwater contamination, say from leakage from a landfill site, then that might be a significant contributing factor. But that if you're further inland, inland, my best guess is that tourism is, you know, people directly swimming in the cenote or um, refuse, you know, that is being that is part of the tourism industry is contributing to it um, more directly. And so I don't know that the answer is to say we shouldn't have tourists in cenotes. Like it's a really important part of the <laughs> local economy. Um, but it is a thing that needs to be considered thoughtfully and thoughtfully means that we have specific management strategies in place. And right now it is more of a free for all. Um, and so, um, you know, things like establishing ecologically based carrying capacities where we know if we have X number of tourists in that it can sort of bounce back, you know, it's like diluting the pollution that goes into the groundwater or um, just better, uh, I don't want to say education, but better enforcement of concern uh, uh, of, you know, sunscreen application, that sort of stuff going into uh, um, cenotes would be helpful. Yeah, I like I like that you make that difference. Like you were going to say education and then you were like, no, enforcement. Actually. <laughs> I'm very hesitant to say that environmental education will solve any of our present problems. Like people need to understand their problem. But we I think that this past year and a half has taught us globally that people don't always make informed decisions. <laughs> 
Exactly. I fully, I fully agree with you. And so uh, my question is now moving towards the more positive side of things. So which solutions do you think we should implement besides the, the management? Are there any other ideas out there on how to solve this issue? Um, Emily, do you want to, do you have anything that you'd like to share? Um, I guess you can go, you can okay. um, share first. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I hate to harp on this idea of regulation and management, but this is the way that we have seen with many environmental problems globally, successful intervention when there's a problem, right? So as soon as you choose to measure and regulate, it's showing your priority towards maintaining an environmental resource. So, you know, in the United States, when we um, when we put certain legal protections around things, then you have recourse for action when when that is not followed. And so, having some sort of legal framework sets the sets the agenda, sets the priority, and sets the goal of, of maintaining the ecological um, integrity of these minotes. And so, again, I. I this, Tourism is vital to this region, so the answer is not no tourists in Synoptis. It's how do we do this in a way that chooses to maintain some level of ecological integrity while still allows people to enjoy the Synoptis. And right now that just really hasn't been happening. And the other concern that I would say has to do with sort of just regional management strategies is that a lot of these, a lot of these Synoptis are being developed um, in a way that is causing not a land rush, but people are buying up land to access cenotes because you can't purchase water, right? But you can purchase the land that the water is on. And so it's, it, it is causing some tensions in the region around um, indigenous land holdership and sort of who gets access to land and cenote owners are deeply protective of their properties and knowledge about how many tourists are coming in their business operations, understandably so. Like it's a competitive economic environment, but that does make it challenging to make good regulatory decisions without some upper you know, without the the municipality or the state saying this is a priority for us. I'm going to get a, a little bit sidetracked here, but I just want to mention that the first time I went to Mexico, the owner of the Airbnb where I was staying was a cenote hunter. And his task was actually to send some locals out in the jungle to find cenotes that hadn't been found before and then buy that land for a very cheap price to then sell it to U.S. or let's say foreign uh, people so that they would own a piece of pristine water. And this is exactly what you're talking about yes. right now. Like this is actually happening. And this is this is terrifying, to be honest. Yeah. And, you know, I think that much like much like you see in all areas of the world, this creates this intense tension between the tourist economy and local indigenous rights and local indigenous economies. And so, um unplanned development often leads to exacerbation of social inequalities. And so there needs to be more thoughtful planning. Very nice. I was very um, pleased to read in your bio that you're <clears throat> both interested in uh, minority STEM education and women being in STEM education. Um, I'm working with uh, every seafaring linguistic group from Campeche to uh, or from the Western Caribbean, from Campeche to uh, Puerto Limon in Costa Rica, and all, and we've we've been developing methods to uh, seamlessly combine indigenous ecological knowledge systems with Western science to create this next level biocultural STEM curriculum to, in local languages to be used in these schools. So I'm really pleased about that. Mm -hmm. But what I like to hear, because you're, this is to our audience, but this is this question is. Your answer is specifically to me as well. Um, how do, what are your recommendations for getting uh, more women and minorities into universities and into the science field? Because that's one of the goals that we hope will be a spinoff of what we're doing. This we will, you know, I, I think these indigenous peoples being the resource managers is an awesome idea. And do you have any suggestions for me personally and for our audience about how to encourage that kind of stuff? I'm going to let Emily go first because I could talk about this for like four hours. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can start it off. Um, this is a very, actually, when I saw the question on the document, I was like, wait, this is one of the hardest questions <laughs> um, out of the whole document, just because um, 
when I think about that, I always think of my story, you know, as a woman of color in STEM and just how I became, like, interested in STEM. Um, you know, growing up, I was always interested in, like, the sciences and, like, math. I just, like, it just got my attention, like, so much. It, I don't know. It just came naturally to me, right? And when I went to college, I knew I wanted to do either science or math just because I've, I've always been attracted to it. Um and then being in college, I found out that, you know, minorities aren't represented as much in STEM. So I think that was, I know it sounds weird to say it, but it was more like a push to go even further, if that makes sense, knowing that there aren't that many minorities in STEM. Um, so when I did the REU program, the research experience for undergrads, um, I feel like it opened up a whole new like door for me. It like opened up research experience. It opened up like um, conference. I went to conferences, like uh, research conferences, you know, um, co uh, it opened up like contacts, like, you know, like networking and then grad school, which is like grad school had always been in the back of my mind, but I never thought I was going to go just because I never knew much about it. But when I did this program, it like opened my eyes to how how accessible grad school can be, especially um, being low income and being a first gen, like there's a lot of people who will help you out. And I was lucky enough to work with Courtney in the summer of 2019. And I really, really enjoy working with her. Um, and I mentioned to her that I was like, oh, like this would actually be like really cool to follow and like a grad school, like jokingly, right? Like joking, I was like, this would be really cool, like work to do in like a master's or something. And then she was like, if you come here, like we can't keep working like down in Mexico and this could be your thesis. And then I was like, wait, what? <laughs> so then I, um, they informed me, the program did, the mentors and everything. They informed me how, you know, grad school is accessible because they can like they can pay for your like studies and they can like also give you like assistantships and all of that so um definitely programs like the one i did were super helpful for me and i can speak also um my colleagues who i was doing the program with there were six of us and three of us are now in grad school and then all of all six of us were not we're not thinking of grad school. We're, we didn't think it was an option, but now 50% of us are now in grad school. Um, so I think programs like that has made it really changed my life. And as well as mentors who I was lucky enough to know, work with my mentor and like have an experience with her. So I know that I could work with her in the masters. Um, so definitely people that not understand you, but want to see you succeed. And they want to like be there to help you to like lift you. Um, you know, this is a hard question as well because um, as minorities, women of color, all of that, the system is kind of against you. You know, like specifically like um, fields like geography, it's very like um, white male dominated. So it can be really hard. It can be really easy to get lost and to feel like you don't belong there, but just know that you do belong there, that you're there for a reason. And there are people that will help you and lift you up whenever you need to, like Courtney has. I'm really grateful that she's my mentor. Um, but yes, I can I can talk about this all day. <laughs> well, I think yeah, Emily cool. is one of the success stories in my mind because she, you know, the mentor-mentee relationship is one of the things that we know from research. It gets women and minorities into STEM and keeps women and minorities in STEM. Um, but as Emily alluded to, one of the really big challenges is this, this feeling of not belonging and this feeling that you as an individual need to just sort of power through and prove something. And um, some former colleagues and I did a research study looking at these push-pull factors and what gets, what is actually, what factors are getting students into undergraduate STEM fields. And what we found was that a lot of people were conceptualizing this as this um, individual problem. And so they were being told, you know, there's, there's like STEM Barbie, like, you know, scientist Barbie dolls, and there's like all these STEM camps for girls. And um, it's giving people the idea that if they just emulate this behavior and they do this thing and they work really, really hard and power through it, they'll, they'll be successful in STEM. And that's true to a certain degree until they hit these institutional roadblocks. 
right? And so this ultimately is a structural problem where we need we need better training for people who are in STEM already and better like formalized opportunities for women and minorities to be successful in STEM. And so I think that the research experience for undergraduates program through the National Science Foundation that Emily was part of is a really good example of these more formalized programs where students are given a paid opportunity to spend a summer working with research mentors um, and to really be exposed to it. And the first time I mentioned graduate school to Emily, she said, oh, I could never do grad school. Like people like me don't do grad school, right? Um, and you know, this is the thing I hear a lot from students and, and it's easy to see why students feel that way if they don't see themselves represented in STEM. Um, and so this is a problem that goes all the way from the bottom to the top, top, top of the field at academic universities, at private industry, and um, changing it will require more than just willpower on the part of women and people of color. It requires creating structural changes that, that create welcoming environments and they create opportunities for advancement that are fair, right? Um, and so uh, one of the challenges that we, or one of the things that we identified in this, this project that we did before that we called STEMinism, sort of like feminism <laughs> for women in STEM, was that when girl, when women were going off to college and saying, I want to be an engineer, I want to be, you know, a biologist or whatever, and then doing everything that they felt was right and still hitting these barriers that were sometimes quite unfair and based on their gender, they felt like they personally had failed. And so um, you, they, you, you can't just muscle your way through it if, you know, your professor, for example, is treating you differently than your male colleagues or if the, the review process is biased against you. Um, and so, yeah, we need change from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the, <laughs> to the top. But the mentorship, um, I think, does play a really key role in providing not just mentorship, but um, like really hands-on opportunities to engage women and, and young girls and STEM at young ages so that they can say, this is a thing that girls do, or this is a thing that people of color do um, and can do quite well. So, yeah. Definitely. I, I fully feel you. And as a young scientist still with a small kid, I can tell you that the, the invisible ceiling, the glass ceiling is uh, reached before you think about it. And then you realize, hey, but they promised me that things were changing. And then they're not really changing as fast as they should. So I fully agree that having role models in science that they can look up to and say, OK, we can also do it because there are people already out there mm -hmm. doing it. Uh, that would definitely have help things. Yeah, and I don't forward. know if you've heard the analogy of the leaky pipe pipeline that gets used a lot in STEM, but it's the idea that we often get a lot of young girls that are interested in STEM fields. And as you go through, you sort of leak them out of the pipeline. And so you lose a certain percentage going off to college and another percentage after the bachelor's. And by the time you get to the PhD, there's like very few women graduating and same for people of color. And then you see that same process, at least at academic institutions between um, incoming assistant professorship and like full professorship. And that is certainly not because women or people of color are less good at science, right? It has to do with all these institutional barriers that they encounter, that glass ceiling that you run up against. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, thank you both of you for this really amazing uh, interview. I learned a lot. I guess our listeners also learned a lot. Um, I hope that uh, in the future when we continue doing research in, in Mexico and these areas, we see an improvement thanks to your work that, uh, you know, there are more regulations put in place and that uh, the notches are protected and they keep on being the treasure they are. And yeah, good luck with all your all your projects. And Emily, go for it. You can do it. I'm to assistant <laughs> professor or whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great Thank you so much for having us today. This is really wonderful to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much for being Bye. here. Bye, guys. Thanks. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye. That was a pretty good um, interview today. Those are uh, some really nice people. We got representatives from Guatemala and uh, up here in the States. And um, I, I just thoroughly enjoy myself, as always. But uh, so, Francisco, what was your take home message today? My big take home message, which made me really happy is that they said that 
they are working on a study that looks at the impacts of when the tourism and also locals going to Cenotes was um, going very low or non-existing due to COVID. And then as people are coming back um, with regulations being lifted, what is happening to the Cenotes? Because together with other um, colleagues, I'm working on a study, not personally, but they, other colleagues are doing the field work to do this for coral reefs. And COVID really is like this experiment that we have around the world where we can really find out the carrying capacity of tourism and the impacts of tourism. And I'm really happy that they're using this opportunity as well. And it will hopefully help them get those policies in place that they want to put in place. And the other thing I was thinking during the interview, yeah. we talked about, you know, the sargassum being stored in places, being, you know, in those landfills. Maybe there should be regulations on how far away those can be from cenotes, that what those landfills shouldn't be really close to cenotes or in places where the groundwater flows towards the cenote. Because as they said, in the cenote itself, it's a really, really cool ecosystem. I always bring my mask and snorkel because there's all these algae and plants and fish and everything in there. One of them apparently even has an alligator in it. I didn't see it, but... Apparently, it's there. So, yeah, you want to protect those um, species as well and the ecosystem to have the beauty of the cenote that the tourists go for and the locals as well. Yeah, I thought it was um, actually super interesting how this COVID pandemic will actually enable them to answer that question that they couldn't answer today, which is what is worse, the, the tourists or the sargassum? Because during COVID, you still had sargassum, but you had almost no tourists. So they will actually be able to see that difference. And I fully agree with you that um, putting in place uh, stricter regulations, not only for the tourism, which I guess it's relatively easy to do, you know, to put some quotas, uh, to access the cenotes and so on, but to then claim, okay, the sargassum is really so bad when it leaks to the groundwater that we really need to solve that part as well. And that will put pressure also on this landfill issue to either remove them or make them safe or, you know, just do, don't bring the sargassum to the landfill. It's bad for the climate. It's bad for the groundwater. It's bad for, for everything. So it's just another point of view that we hadn't touched until now. And I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, well, the thing about that leaching all, you know, we're, we're mostly talking about the Yucatan today, but, um, you know, all this water in the Yucatan sits on that lens. It's a lens of fresh water on top of salt water, and it's the same on islands. So this research is going to have a lot of um, uh, applications for, uh, you know, the island nations of the Caribbean that's being affected by this and this, per you know, chelates and stuff percolating through. So that's uh, so it's really important stuff they're doing. Well, it was. It was very nice uh, to see that a, a young woman that thought that she could never ever do research is actually has found a cool mentor and is actually doing really cool work. So that was very, very inspiring to me. Yes, that was inspiring for me too. And I have s sent so many letters for my past students who want to apply to those R RUI projects and to internships. Um, and they need letters of recommendation. So hearing that these projects really can change somebody's course and uh, that 50% of the students in the project actually went to grad school afterwards, I'm like, makes me really motivated to write those letters and take the time to do that and help them out. Excellent. Yeah, this has been a really good day and on so many levels, uh, both academically and, and it's been good for my heart as well. Make me feel real good. And all. It's, it's always good to be inspired by young people. But that being said, we're going to call it a day here. Um, you could have been anywhere on the planet with us today, but you chose to be here with us. We really appreciate it. Um, this particular episode is being brought to you by Seafields. And I own, they're doing some really good work out there, and I hope you'll, uh, you'll check them out and see what's going on. And with that, uh, have you a good time, and we'll see you here next week. See you next week. Bye, everyone.
you for tuning in today and learning with us from our guests. If you want more information about what our guests talked about today, then please check our show notes for links and information in our archives. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. If you enjoyed our podcast, please consider supporting us financially by becoming a patron. For as little as $1 per month, you can support us and get exclusive benefit of submitting questions for our interviewees before the interview. The Sargasm Podcast is produced by Marine Conservation Without Borders and is made possible with financial support from Seafields and the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center. U.S. Department of Education, Title V grant. It is produced by Marcel Van de Camp, Lauren Blankenship, Cleo Maridakas, Francisca Elmer, and Eloise Lopez, and hosted by Robbie Thigpen, Francesca Elmer, Mar Fernandez, Florence Menez, Cleo Maridakas, and Paula Diaz. We will be back next week with another exciting guest. The music of this podcast is from the song Dama Prey by Drizzle the Roadrunner, an artist from Roatan. Follow him on Spotify or YouTube for more music. But for now, here is the full song, Dama Prey. Hey, brother, hear me now. Brother, dog. Now me understand. Now for them no one be see we get nothing. That's why they must be and always front and star. Now for them no one be see we get nothing. That's why they must be. Now for them a free. They must free. They must free. Me no gain progress. Now for them a free. They must free. Me no gain success. Now for them a free. They my free, me no gain progress, not for them my free. They my free, me no reap success, so me tell them yeah. Rap is my money, no take that, only if it come from jail, I'll accept that. Not for them I put my trust in, I give me set back. Yo, select that, me lamp pull up that, tell some wicked that. But my thing no pay them, anytime them cheat and chat, me no hear them. Me dash a few hearts, so body queer them. Me dash a few hearts, so tell them wear them. Not for them I'm free, they my free, me no gain progress. Not for them I'm free, they my free, me no reap success. So me tell them yeah. Yes, me know me have a lot of fake friends, but me never would have taught me would have have fake family. So me tell them straight, me no trust them, me no trust you, and me no trust him. Fake friends, but mine in a real life. Star, me, no rate that. me no read that, star, me no read that. But me real family would have bust a million shot in a real life. Real, real, real life. Now for them I'm free, them I'm free, me no gain progress. Now for them I'm free. My free, me no reap success. Now for them, I'm free. They my free, me no gain progress. Now for them, I'm free. They my free, me no reap success. So me tell them, yeah. Like, but they my hate and grudge and creep on mine. They my move like Judas. They my move like Judas. Plus, everybody have a life to live. So they give one rash clock. Who I try judge me like them chit and chat. So what them want to say? Cause none of them out there. Not nah, for them, I'm free. They my free. They my free. Me no gain progress. Not for them, I'm free. They my free. Me no rip success. Now for them I'm free, yeah. they my free.